Okay, folks, I know this is probably not the most joyous uh, TJF we have had. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, let's face it, most uh, people here are uh, pretty upset and pretty sad for uh, because of the election. Um, but there's another group, a uh, small group, that we should also think about who are very excited about the legalization of pot. Uh, um, I was asking if we could serve joints outside on the patio. Appar apparently these things take a little while to take effect. As a huge, huge disappointment. Um, I've been bemoaning that all week, I'll be honest with you. Um, uh, but uh, anyway, on a more uh, serious note, you know, myself, um, uh, as an immigrant and a refugee, um, I, I certainly find this election uh, deeply offensive, and I know many of you do too. Um, and, and I think it's a very stressful time, uh, and it uh, conflicts with many of our values. Um, I think it's, uh, it's a good time to reflect on that, and uh, you know, we're going to uh, hopefully uh, share some thoughts uh, today. Um, I guess you know, there are two dominant um, you know, reasons to be upset. One is because, you know, so many people uh, apparently don't share uh, many of the values that we have. Um, I mean, I guess we've known that for many months now. I mean, it's not like, you know, in election terms, whether it was like 47.2% or 48.2% or whatever it was, um, and it's always been uh, a lot of people that uh, apparently feel that way. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly confronting it firsthand um, is, uh, is pretty upsetting. Uh, and secondly, confronting the reality of an administration that's, uh, that's now forming, and look, we have no idea what it's going to do, is the honest truth. Like, we have no idea what direction this country will take, um, whether whatever the past policy proposals were serious or not, or whatnot, and it's a period of great uncertainty. And, um, you know, it's uncertain for many of us here. Um, you know, especially immigrants or minorities, uh, women. Um, uh, I mean, so many people, and, and just generally, you know, people who you know, have kids and wonder about their world. Um, so uh, I don't have great answers for you up here today, but I think it's important that uh, we, we chat about it and um, are thoughtful about it in the coming months. And with that, Sundar. Thanks, Sergei. It's good to, good to see all of you here. I'm glad uh, we're getting together uh, at a moment like this. Uh, you know, it's been an extraordinarily stressful time, I'm sure, for uh, ma many of you. Uh, you know, it, it, the, the outcome, uh, you know, in a, in a two-party system uh, with, with a lot of polarization in the country. It's a deeply divided country, and you have a binary outcome, uh, right? There is no easy way through this. And you know, historically, all political processes are stressful and tough, particularly if the outcome is not what you hope for. On top of that, I think all of us would agree this election was particularly hard. Uh, there was a lot of rhetoric. Uh, you know, and, uh, and there were a lot of groups targeted. Uh, and so I think all of that makes it a very hard cycle, uh, especially with our values. But I hope, uh, you know, a couple things I would say is, you know, it's important to remember, uh, you know, we are in a democratic system. And, you know, it's heartening to see actually a transition happen properly. And, you know, I grew up in India and there were a lot of things wrong. But it was a democratic country, and we've gone through many, many, many hairy moments like this, right? And it's a country of, uh, you know, poor, it was a poor country of uh, one plus billion people going through a democratic process with many more divided opinions than what you're seeing here. 
and I've seen over time have faith in it. Uh, it tends to work out. Uh, there are many, many scary moments when it looks like the wheels are coming off. Uh, but you know, it tends to make through okay, and you know, it seems to be better than any other system out there. So I think we should keep that in mind. Uh, I think it's a good moment of uh, reflection, uh, introspection, and listening to each other too. I think part of the reason the outcome ended up the way it is is uh, people don't feel heard across uh, across both sides. And I think I think it's important to reach out and talk to each other. There is a lot of fear within Google, and you know, I've gotten a lot of emails, uh, you know, to my note back, uh, you know, and you know, I would tell most Googlers there are people who are very afraid, uh, and you know, Sergey pointed out the, uh, you know, uh, you know, many groups, you know, women, blacks, you know, people who are afraid based on religion, people who are afraid because they are not sure of their status. Uh, the LGBTQ community, and I can go on. There, there is a lot of fear, and so I think I think it's important to reach out, be aware of that fear. Uh, I would be sensitive and try and talk and have conversations uh, to the extent possible. We are so deeply committed to our values. Uh, you know, Sergey mentioned uh, mentioned at the start, nothing will change. I think we'll stand up always for the values we uh, believe in, and especially I think in a society. You stand up for people uh, who are minorities, and that's what defines a society, and we'll continue to do that. Uh, I think we have a few people who are going to come and say thoughts. I'm not sure I can get through everything I wanted to say. So I'm going to have Ken come, say a few things, and we'll come back, and uh, we have a few more people to add thoughts. So look, it, it was a shock to, to all of us, the results of the election. Uh, it, it was a, a fair and democratic process, and, and we honor that. But at the same time, it showed an incredible level of division among Americans. And that's something that gives us pause uh, and, and focuses on how did we misunderstand that? What can we do to reach out to people whose perspective we have a hard time understanding? But it's not just a challenge for America. It's a challenge that goes well beyond America. The implications for the rest of the world are vast, and the echoes around the world are, are significant. This is not the first sign we've seen of this rising tide of nationalism, populism, and concern. There are, there are drivers of globalization and immigration which have sparked movements throughout Europe, throughout Asia, throughout Latin America, you see not just Brexit, but rising uh, new parties that are coming onto the scene, splintering of traditional parties. Uh, we've seen it through Germany and France. Italy has a referendum next month. The Philippines, Thailand, are big chunks of Latin America. Um, we're trying to figure out what our, our right next steps are in that, but we recognize that globalization and the internet have been an incredible force for change. They have brought hundreds of millions of people out of extreme poverty around the world. Incredible force for good. But all politics is local, goes the old phrase. And if you're in Pennsylvania or Birmingham, you may not care that somebody in Delhi is getting a new job or that somebody in Jakarta is getting better health care. You care about what's happened to you and your family. And you're seeing this sense of stagnation that you're not better off than your parents, and you're afraid that you, your kids might not be better off than you are, and what's the path forward? And the forces out there are seem well beyond you, globalization, immigration, trade, whatever, else, and you're afraid, and you're trying to look for answers. And that fear, I think, not just in the United States, but around the world, is what's fueling concerns, xenophobia, hatred, uh, and a desire for, for answers that may or may not be there. It's feeling a distrust of, of experts and disregard of traditional institutions. And we're trying to figure out how do we respond to that? What are the next steps for us before the world comes into this environment of tribalism uh, that's, that's self-destructive on the long term? There are, there are cycles of these things that often can last five, 10 years before people feel as though you know, that they've had a chance to vent that anger. And yet, we do think that history is on our side in a profound and an important way. 
that Martin Luther King made famous a, a line that the moral arc of history is long, but it bends toward justice. I would say that the moral arc of history is long, but it bends toward progress. And out of progress comes rising living standards and better health care, and ultimately the ability to transcend those forces of tribalism, and yes, reach toward justice. So for 500 years, technology and trade has risen, have raised living standards around the world, and I think there's every sign that we'll continue to do that. That as we help that change come to pass, while it may be that the internet and globalization were part of the cause of this problem, we are also fundamentally an essential part of the solution to this problem. Prime Minister Matteo Renzi in Italy talks about two worlds, the world of the wall and the world of the square. The world of the wall, the world of the fortress, the world of the silo, isolation and defensiveness. And the world of the square, the piazza, the agora, the marketplace, where people come together into a community and enrich each other's lives. The tools that we build help people come into the world of the square. You saw the video about Missouri Star Quilt changing the fortunes of not just a family, not just a community, the entire village was made better by the tools that we make every day. We help people come together, build together, cooperate, communicate. Google is a trusted source of information for people around the world. That's incredibly valuable at times like this. To make that happen, to figure out how we're going to navigate not only continuing to make transformative products and making the world a better place, and yeah, I'll say it even though they mock Silicon Valley for believing it, we need to be able to work together. We need to have each other's back. We need to stand together in a time that's going to be incredibly difficult as we advocate for our values and we see what not only the US administration but other administrations around the world take shape, how they take shape over the next few years. I would say, please, Understand each other, trust each other, trust in the rule of law. And let me turn it over to first Ruth and then Eileen to talk about how we internally can continue that work of building bridges and working together. So for what it's worth, um, I've been a very long time Hillary supporter. But as Kent said, the most important thing is I very much respect the outcome of the democratic process and who any one of us voted for is really not the point because the values that are held dear at this company transcend politics because we're going to constantly fight to preserve them. <clears throat> I want to take you back to um, 8.30 p.m. on Tuesday night. I was at home with friends and family watching the election returns. And uh, as we started to see the direction of the voting, I reached out to someone close to me who was at the Javits Center where the big celebration was supposed to occur in New York City, somebody who had been working on the campaign. And um, I just sent him a note and said, are, you know, are you okay? It looks like it's going the wrong way. And I got back a very sad short text um, that read, people are leaving. Staff is crying, we're going to lose. Uh, that was the first moment I really felt like we were going to lose. And it was this massive like, kick in the gut that we were going to lose. And it was really painful. And the thing that hit me, and I've talked about it here before, was like Sergei, my, my father was a refugee, and we moved to this country. And as a child, what I was always told is, he fought hard, worked hard to get my sister and brother and I to this country because he wanted to, he wanted us to grow up in a place unlike what he had, a place where you could, you would never be discriminated against based on who you were, the color of your skin, your religion, your beliefs. Um, and that's the thing that kept going through my head on Tuesday. And um, it did feel like a ton of bricks dropped on my chest and I've had a chance to talk to a lot of fellow Googlers and people have said different words, similar concept, this, how, painful is it, how painful this is. But I think there are three really important things that we should think about and talk about. First, throughout the campaign, Hillary said, we are a great country because we are a good country. And I firmly believe that. We are a good country. Second, one of the things that really struck me in her, her concession 
speech the next morning, she said, please never stop believing that fighting for what's right is worth it. And that is critical. We all have an obligation to fight for what's right and to never stop fighting for what's right. And that's one of the many things that I think makes this company so beautiful. Our values are strong, we will fight to protect them, and we will use the great strength and resources and reach we have to continue to advance really important values. And the third message that's super important is the message from the election that a lot of people clearly felt disenfranchised, left out. We talk a lot about rising inequality, but how corrosive rising inequality is is the other really important message from this. And on that, we similarly have a very important role to play, as do, as do many others. So I think the main thing I just wanted to say is give yourself time and space to deal with whatever you're going through. Healing is a process. It does take time. But one thing that makes Alphabet at Google so special is this term I heard, I'd never heard it before I got here, which is this is a place where you can bring your whole self to work. And we want everybody, wherever you were on the political spectrum, whatever it is, it's about respect for one another and continuing to ensure that we do that and making this a safe place where it's super clear everyone can bring their whole self to work and be respected. So showing kindness to everyone around you is the most important thing. I feel super blessed to have had the opportunity to be a part of this community and especially at times, um, at times like now. So yesterday, I, um, Eileen and I had a, a town hall for some of our orgs and um, I suggested that what we all need right now is a hug. So everybody, if you could turn around or go to the person next to you <laughs> and do a hug, it works. <laughs> I Over to Eileen. All righty, so thank you, Ruth. Thanks for the hugs. Um, I'm Eileen. Um, I uh, lead people operations at Google. I've been participating in TGIFs for about 10 years from remote offices in New York and London. And I kind of always imagine my first time up here and people ask to be good news around Google Geist or something, but. Here we are. Uh, and you know, we, we talk a lot, and we all know it, we talk a lot about what it is to be googly, and I've seen so many uh, instances and examples of googliness in the last two, two days, the hug is, is one. Uh, I've seen open and heartfelt communications, I've seen people feel safe sharing their thoughts, their dreams, their fears. I've seen Googlers show up for each other, spontaneous groups of um, employee resource groups, holding sessions, sharing notes, sharing resources, tips for how to get through hard times. I've seen gratitude, and I've seen a lot of kindness these last few days. So let's try to internalize the kindness and keep it with us. I've seen Googlers talk about their differences from a place of tolerance and respect, and that's very heartening. And I've seen us try to intellectualize and understand the election result. Uh, much as Googlers earlier this year when I was in London tried to understand the vote of the uh, British people to uh, exit the European Union. And just like with Brexit, I'm seeing Googlers who are full of fear. They're full of fear about the future. They're full of fear about what the uncertainty means for them and their families. And uh, so since I'm in people ops, a lot of the questions I'm getting are how the Trump presidency might impact things like benefits and visas and jobs. So there's a tremendous amount we don't know. I would just advise us all to be calm. You know, there's a GCOM place on, that you can go to and just take, take a breath. Um, it's obviously too soon to tell what the longer term uh, implications of the election will be, but we're watching closely. And in the meantime, I thought I'd address three or four of the topics that we're hearing the most about. And first and foremost is immigration. Uh, we have nearly 10,000 Googlers in the US uh, on visas. 
uh, very understandably, those of you who are working here, who have families here, or in the process of renewing or getting visas, uh, are probably very concerned. So here's what we know. There is, for the time being, and absent any policy recommendation from the Obama administration, there's no ch change, right? Google should not expect to be hassled entering the border. Uh, there should be no change in your status. We also know that the nature of the U.S. immigration system is such that it makes, and there are legal limitations, it makes any immediate changes after January's inauguration of the new administration highly unlikely. Uh, but we, are, of course, will keep a close watch on this. Our policy office in, in D.C. is all over it. And we will keep you informed, but you, we will keep Googler's interests at heart. And we will, of course, fight to retain all the visas and then some, because we keep adding to this. On the other hand, it's heartening also to know Google has operations in more than 50 countries. And at Google, because our people come first, we work really hard to find you, to help you grow. We're going to keep you. We're going to keep you here, I hope. Uh, but we have also taken a position for the past 10 years with the U.S. government to fix what is a very broken immigration system in this uh, country, and we are going to continue to um, take that fight forward. So nothing should be uh, changing there in the near term that we can see. The second question is around internal mobility. Can I move to Canada? <laughs> Now, one could guesstimate that at least 50% of Americans are interested in moving to Canada right now. <laughs> and that might mean maybe at least 50% of Googlers might be interested in moving to Canada. Uh, Toronto and uh, Waterloo can't handle us all, I'm afraid. But look, we move people at Google all the time. I just moved here to California six, seven weeks ago. Um, we moved 8,900 people in the last 12 months. We expect we'll be moving well more than 10,000 next year. So we care about your talent development and mobility independent of this election. So uh, for those of you interested, you know, pay attention. We do move people around. And, and you know, we really we have the most amazing collection of talent in any corporation in our space. We are not going to lose talent for uh, lack of comfort in staying in, in this country. So. So that's that. The next thing where I've heard some concerns around are benefits and what does this mean, especially from Googlers who are concerned about benefits for their same-sex partners. We are here behind you. We have led in this area. We will not in any way change our benefits. Our, that is completely... And we're very proud to take a very public stand on that issue. So nothing else ch changes there. And then finally, on diversity and inclusion, I think it's fairly obvious that Google, by, uh, Google leans largely uh, liberal and democratic. But I do want to be clear that diversity also means uh, diversity of opinion and political persuasion. Uh, and we value and welcome perspectives from, uh, perspectives from all sides of the political spectrum. So I have heard from some conservative Googlers lately uh, in the past few days that they haven't felt uh, entirely comfortable revealing who they are uh, when these conversations come up at work. And so I believe we need to do better. We need to be tolerant, inclusive, try to understand uh, each other in this area. And you know, just to emphasize what Sundar said in opening, and, and Sergey as well, you know, the, the very core values of civility, inclusion, respect are what have always guided us and will continue to do so. So I know a lot, you have a lot of questions. We're going to take them up here. We're also going to have some food and drinks on Charlie's patio for Googlers who are here in Mountain View. I know there are large groups, probably Ann Arbor, Chicago, many offices, uh, New York, uh, probably live tuned in, so hope you have something to drink. <laughs> Water helps, you know, I mean, you don't always have to add from one problem and start a whole other one. But anyway, with that, uh, I think we'll take your questions. Okay, thank you very much. Let's see who's coming up. We've got three chairs here. Let's see, I think uh, Sundar, Ruth, uh, but and, I think uh, there are many people. Yeah, we, can get, we can add a chair, or you can stand like I do. Grab a chair. Just saying.
Outstanding. Bum bum. It's a good one. It's good. Wow. We planned that earlier today. Um, okay. Um, so the first question is: This week's election demonstrated the problems with bubbles, confirmation bias, failure to listen, and so forth. Um, what should we say about that? I think that's a really big topic, okay. personally. Um, do we have an answer? No. Um, but uh, I think uh, I think there are several examples of uh, of bubbles. Um, uh, you know, one thing is, you know, we saw a whole bunch of pollsters and so forth be, like, really wrong. Not the pollsters themselves, I think, people interpreting the polls, uh, and uh, including probably all those folks getting ready to celebrate at the Javits Center, who I think didn't actually look at the data very carefully. Um, but, um, so, yeah, there's definitely groupthink can be a, a, a huge risk. Uh, there's also just uh, this uh, story of two countries, um, you know, the divided nation and so forth. Um, I personally happen to think that's a little bit of an exaggeration of an explanation when you actually look at all the data, but um, there are definitely different folks who are different walks of life and uh, have different perspectives, and we definitely value uh, seeing more points of view. Um, there's also a huge issue with uh, trolling, um, state-sponsored trolling, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, corporate-motivated um, uh, bias and so forth among media companies in multiple directions, mind you. So I, I think there's like a huge set of issues here all wrapped up in one question. I don't think we can cover it in all one go, but I think, I think we should be more thoughtful about it. No, I, I mean, look, I think it's good. I think, uh, you know, it's, uh, Sergey said it, this is a, a deep issue, I think. Over time, as we, uh, you know, we are definitely in the role, it's our core mission uh, to help users discover information. There are many, many places where we are ranking, we are algorithmically doing stuff. You know, so over time, understanding some of the uh, things that are happening and course correcting, I think it's good, but you know, it's, it's a very, very difficult problem to, uh, to tackle. But I think it's a moment of uh, reflection, as I said earlier, for a lot of us, and I think there's good feedback in the question. Um, but let's do the audience question, yes. Yeah, so a lot of Googlers are maxing out on their charitable giving contributions, contributing to organizations such as ACLU and Equal Justice Initiative after following this election. Can we increase the gift match caps or designate uh, certain civil justice liberties organizations as a crisis response special uh, special donations that are matched uh, without... Yeah, it's a, it's a yeah. good suggestion. I don't know that... Uh, maybe we'll have to chat about it a little bit. What's today's match? Six, twelve? I can't remember. Uh, it's uh, six, six thousand okay. dollars. Uh, and, you know, you, you, know, you, you know, we we actually are... You know, we, are, we have a framework as to how we are thinking about how to do charitable giving. And just more importantly, even as Google, uh, the efforts we do. Uh, and, you know, typically we're going to spend a lot more in education. Uh, economic opportunity, and, and that is important because I think one of the things in this uh, election too is thinking through the effects, the dislocation people feel, and how we could do, we could be doing more. Uh, I think those are important things to think about too, and uh, and the third is around you know inclusion and all all the stuff that goes with it. So these are the areas. I think your suggestion is a is a good one, and we'll definitely take a look. Thank you. Uh, uh, oh, um, okay, what's up with this uh, likely FCC chairman pick, <laughs> yeah, so, Eisenach? So anybody who thinks they know the likely members of the Trump administration is um, taking premature advantage of Sergey's favorite California proposition. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> Nobody knows. Um, and hey, Trent Kent, that's not till 2018. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and hence premature. Uh, okay, so, well, I mean, <laughs> first off, uh, so this, we don't know. A lot of possibilities, a lot of names being floated. The Trump campaign did not have the same sort of detailed transition run up that the Clinton campaign had. So we don't even know who's doing some of the transition work in some cases. If it were somebody like uh, Jeffrey Eisenach, this is somebody who actually has been constructive on issues like 
surveillance reform, antitrust issues, and the like, and more challenging on other issues like net neutrality, for example. Can I, can I add one thing here? We are, our DC team is thoughtfully engaging with the transition team of the new administration. I think one thing I, you know, we need Googlers to understand is you are going to see communication happen, and it's important to be supportive of those conversations too. I think people are actually afraid also to interact and do those conversations. And so, but you know, uh, it is important that we are thoughtful because for us to be effective, uh, we need to be able to participate in those transition conversations as well. Absolutely, and, and we're working on that now. But let me say two additional things. One, the, it's gonna, there's gonna be a lot of you know, ebb and flow over these issues as, as we go forward. Um, we, on net neutrality, we're hoping that the tradition that we've established over the last 10, maybe 20 years, of no improper interference in the flow of data actually takes on a life of its own after a certain period of time. And the forces of public opinion and the like will make it harder and harder for carriers to improperly interfere uh, in what people are, are able to see. Uh, but lastly, the, the notion of being able to go in and say, um, we're gonna be dealing with people in different ways. We're gonna have to deal with a new cast of characters. We're figuring out who those characters are and what their, uh, their policies will be. So, the approach will differ, the tactics will differ, but the principles stay the same. We're going to continue to be con uh, committed to a free and open internet. Doesn't change. Okay, audience question, yes. Uh, thanks for your warm words. I, like I think many others, have been watching the stock market recently, especially Google stock or Alphabet stock. So just a question, how do you guys think the election and specifically Trump's campaign proposals are going to affect Alphabet as a business? Well, I'll start on the, the market point and then I'm sure others are gonna wanna jump in. The market reaction's been really bizarre. Um, you know, when the vote, as many people saw, at first the market was indicating down 800 and now it's up. I think one of the kind of sad realities in the market is that the bank stocks are up a lot because banks are going to be a beneficiary and um, so you'd say people who were left behind feeling left you know, like they've been marginalized and looking to somebody for positive change well a lot of the policies actually are very pro-bank and because that's a lot of his advisors or hedge fund guys so that's to me a really sad kind of quick response to what kind of policies are people expecting. But very much to Kent's point, nobody really knows, and so it could kind of be a bit of a head fake going on in the market because people are guessing and hoping it's gonna go in a certain direction. So I, I don't think, it, I think it's premature to read too much into it. And part of what goes on, and we've talked about it in some prior um, TGIFs, is you sell your winners to buy whatever else you wanna do. So you're seeing a bit of a rotation and whether that's fear about what he's gonna do in tech, it's way, way too early to know. As we're looking at the various policies, like we have a business and a strategy that's focused on long-term doing good things for users and good things follow from that. So that's, that's what we're sticking with. I don't know if anybody wants to add anything to that. No? Cool. Um, okay. Um, what's up with us making people rich and coastal and poor in the middle? Uh, <laughs> So uh, first we of all, actually we do have uh, um, uh, different offices around the country, as many people know. Um, we do have one in Chicago. We're also in Larry's home state in Michigan. Um, we're also we have one in Boulder. We've got one in Austin. So we are around the country, and a lot of people actually like that as one of their options because quality of living and cost of living uh, is different. Chicago is on the lake. It's kind of coastal. <laughs> cool. Okay, we'll go with that. There it goes. There you go. So, uh, and but it's a, it's a really it's a good question. And as we we constantly look at what makes sense and what would Googlers actually really like. So we'll we'll continue looking at it. Um, yeah, I would I would here I'll throw up my theory here. Uh, I think everybody's presuming that some of these folks left behind are you know specifically the people who voted for Trump. I don't think the data quite supports that. I mean I know there's the kind of geographic, roughly speaking, spread. But in fact, Hillary won the low income vote. In fact, people under $100,000 support Hillary and over 100,000 support Trump. Um, I actually looked at the data you know, fairly carefully. And um, uh, I think the, the biggest relationship was whether people had really routine jobs um, in, a, in an area. And that correlated highly 
uh, with Trump support versus having non-routine jobs. And there's actually a lot of historical precedent for boredom being a huge factor in vote hmm. uh, choice um, and actually in building extremism. In fact, we've had a lot of work on uh, Jigsaw on uh, extremism um, that's, uh, um, that shows high correlation to simple boredom, you know. Um, also, when people vote, and you know, I know people who voted for Trump, and people who abstained, and people who voted for Johnson, and so forth. Like, voting is not a rational act, as all of you know. For those of you who are in California, it's like there's just no point in voting in the, in the presidential election, in particular, because California can't possibly matter. Um, <laughs> and uh, but still, go out and vote. <laughs> well, this is between us. I, But, but even in the so-called swing states, you know, there are tens of thousands of votes apart. So there's no, like, the point of voting uh, is different than, you know, you actually choosing the president. Um, there are a lot of people, in fact, I've talked to the people who, you know, voted in various ways that I might not have agreed with. And, like, if they were had to actually choose the president, they would have made a different choice. And actually, with Brexit, that's also true. Um, it's just a different emotional act. And like, it feels kind of good to just like give DC a big kick when you vote. Like, it feels good. Like, I can kind of get that. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. I think there are a lot of reasons that people, you know, might have voted the way they did. I don't think it's all attributable to, you know, huge income disparity. Although I think income disparity is a negative trend. Uh, it's not a good thing. Um, but I think uh, I think people are being kind of quick to rush to judgment. It's, uh, it's a very good point. Yeah. You know, the first question is about bubbles and confirmation bias yeah. and stuff. It's a good question, except people at the end of the election are doing the same thing, right? And uh, you know, all of us are quick to understand, and there's a very good analysis uh, on 538. If one in 100 people had switched the vote the other way, you know, we would be having a very different electoral outcome, and people would be asking a very different set of questions, saying, this is why this, is, this happened. And uh, you know, so you're talking about it's a very deeply divided country, and voting in only a two-party system, uh, when people are going through a complicated, layered decision-making process, partly rational, partly irrational, uh, you know, is, is very, very complicated. And same way, I wouldn't interpret every vote. While this campaign had a lot of rhetoric and uh, you know, a lot of bad things as part of the campaign, uh, you know, we've all been talking about. It. I'm sure many of you have members, family members, co-workers, et cetera, not everyone who voted on the other side actually stands for everything that is represented as part of that. And so, uh, you know, so we have to work our way through it. Um, okay, with that uh, audience question, yes. Yeah, so with rapid technological proce progress, we've seen that like policy and regulation have not been able to keep pace with technological developments. And as that accelerates, we're gonna see even more fundamental societal change on top of what we already have. And I have concerns that this administration is gonna have a very hard time addressing that. So how do we, as a leader in tech, help make sure that policy and regulation can even potentially keep pace with technological progress and that people aren't getting left behind? Let me answer most of that, and then I mean, I'll try all of it, and then others can jump in. The job of our folks in D.C. and around the world is to try and educate policymakers. Oftentimes that's hard, and regardless of the administration. Uh, and many times the folks from, uh, haven't grown up with the same technologies we're talking about, or we're talking about technologies that no one's seen before. And we're trying to explain how they work, how they benefit people, how they'll impact economies. That work continues. Uh, you're right. I think in some cases, uh, the next question coming up is about encryption. I think that's one where we're going to need to get in and explain the, the merits of our position to people who may not have heard it before or, or internalized it before. That's important. We'll try and move the needle as, as strong as we can. The last part of your question about how we reach out to people who are feeling left behind is equally important. And a lot of the work we're doing that Sundar alluded to, not just on the charitable side of what we're doing, but also thinking about a narrative of how do we make people feel included, new forms of work, concerns about employment displacement that may come with artificial intelligence and machine learning. How do you give people not only jobs, but a sense of purpose and meaning going forward? How should society respond to that? How should employers respond to that? We're thinking about all of those things, working in a cross-functional way to make sure we have a good and convincing story to tell. Um, 
Uh, okay, yeah, that was um, that. Okay, uh, that actually was not the audience. Yes, I guess that was the audience question. Yeah, yeah. thank Sorry. you. That's a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Was that the same thing? I, I feel like, did you just let me, ju let me just take this one. Uh, <laughs> are, are we going to build back doors and give other keys? Um, the, the answer has been no. <laughs> the answer continues to be no. Um, the, okay. the government. The, we have taken the position, alongside Apple and others, that the government, U.S. government and governments around the world do not have the authority right now to compel us to do these things. We'll continue to take that position. We worry about the prospect of potential for regulation, both in the U.S. and around the world, uh, in Europe and other countries that are looking at mandatory kinds of schemes that would, would do this. We're trying to, again, educate and, and make the case that this is not just a privacy versus security issue. This is security versus security. We've actually had remarkable traction with that. And remember, it's not just the president and not just Congress, but the courts and popular opinion that ultimately decide these questions. And we think we've got a great story to tell. All right. Audience question, yes. I don't know what's going to happen, but there's a chance it could be bad. It could be really bad. I think that we should hope for the best and prepare for the worst. Is that how you think about it? Uh, it's a good look. I mean, the, the question you're asking is on many, many people's minds. Uh, you know, as I said, I've gotten many, many emails about this. And, uh, you know, uh, the early indications, you know, in the last 24, 48 hours, uh, you know, have been okay. And there are a lot of, uh, you know, there's a long history of how things have worked in, worked in the U.S. It's a very, very... Uh, you know, well-functioning democracy, and there's a lot of institutions uh, which drive the right outcome as well. Ken gave an example for uh, the encryption question. So I think, you know, you know, uh, you know, we all are in the same position. You are asking the question, which is, we are trying to predict the future. But I think, uh, you know, I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I have faith in the democratic process. Is, is what I would say. Um, okay, uh, you know, as a Muslim, uh, you know, I'm really worried. Um, and what will Google do to take a public stand to defend minorities? Uh, I personally wrote a blog post on it externally uh, on the on the same thing. And so, you know, as Ken said, you know, all our values, you know, nothing has changed, and we'll we'll always take strong positions. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't expect any of that to change at all. And we'll be very strong and vocal and, uh, you know, not just, you know, from a press standpoint or a PR standpoint, but actually working hard behind the scenes uh, to stand up for what's right. Remember, we've, we've, been, we've long been in favor of comprehensive immigration reform. We continue to be in favor of comprehensive immigration reform. And it's important to recognize that while the Republicans and, and the Trump administration, the Trump administration, they have a majority in the Senate, a majority in the House, they don't have a supermajority in the Senate. There's not a, uh, not, they don't have the 60 votes necessary to override uh, a, a filibuster. So there will be some form of check and balance in the legislative process going forward and some opportunity to try and make meaningful progress. Um, and the audience question, yes. Yeah. So as a candidate, Donald Trump once said that he wished for the Russian government to hack the emails of his political opponent. And I know, like, maybe he wasn't serious, and who knows what a Trump administration would actually do. It's probably best to wait and see before taking a drastic action. But in my opinion, one of the bravest things this company has ever done is our 2010 letter, A New Approach to China, where we took a very bold stance on the Chinese government attack, uh, hacking the emails of a group that they probably considered political opponents as well. So is there any potential line a Trump administration could cross where we would think about taking a similar approach towards the United States government? Mm -hmm. uh. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that line was crossed a long time ago for, by the US, you know, as we found out through the Snowden revelations. Um, I mean, they, they, I'd say we were pretty shocked by them. Um, I don't. We probably didn't have quite as profound blog posts, but I think um, I think we definitely had a lot of statements to, uh, about that, and that really harmed uh, our like the U.S. standing in the world with respect to cyber espionage, and um, and harmed 
um, the ability, you know, for companies like ours to make arguments about the, you know, the problems of cyber espionage. Uh, it's it's a real issue. Now we since then have built up, you know, a huge amount of information security technologies. Um, you know, in, in the wake, actually even before and in the wake of Snowden, we had. Uh, you know, encrypted all of our backbone traffic and things like that. Um, I think we need to be even more vigilant these days. And uh, I mean, we see cyber espionage being used as a real tool uh, by many countries, um, and including Russia, including uh, you know the phishing attack for uh, for uh, John Podesta that was you know, the source of all these um, leaks. That were you know the actual fish was also released. Uh, as a part of it, and it, it was a relatively sophisticated one. Uh, but it shows to me that we have much work left to do. And uh, I think we, we both need to take a strong stand, pro-cybersecurity, uh, pro-privacy, um, you know, against government surveillance. Uh, and we need to technologically defend against those things, too, uh, with ever more fervor. I mean, the size of our, you know, the number of targets within our ecosystem is so high and so valuable, as you guys saw. I mean, and certainly with such a razor-thin margin in the election, you can almost guarantee that that was uh, an effect. And, um, you know, it's a big deal. And I, you know, I'd encourage all of you, particularly on the security team, but, but otherwise, uh, more broadly, you just, uh, we do really need to invest in security. <coughs> Um, in sort of usability for our end users of security. We saw, in that case, it was the email, I mean, everybody's seen this, it wasn't like us specifically that we saw, but, you know, Podesta forwarded the fish to the, like their IT guy who said, oh yeah, this is serious, you should go type your password in that box. Um, that was probably the wrong hire for an IT guy, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, look, this is like presumably professionals who are even recommending this, and you know, we need to be on top of this. We can't, I'm making fun of it as user error, but we can't just say like, oh, that's user error. Like, we need to get more serious about it. And we offer two-factor, but not obviously people who really should take it don't. Um, so we need, to, we need to try harder. Um, to be fair, I think we do send, you know, we, me, I do think we as Google actually send emails occasionally to people asking them to click on a link and uh, log on to. So, <laughs> uh, you know, I think uh, that that's probably a problem. And so yeah, no, should. no, it is. Sorry. <laughs> it, was a, it is a problem. It is. It is. We need to deal with the behavior in these cases, and it's a, it's a challenging thing to deal with, but uh, we need to get better at that. Um, okay. Uh, there's a tax question here. Uh, what happens if the corporate tax is reduced from 35 to 15? And what about, uh, you know, one-time repatriation rate of 10%? So our strategy is driven by what makes sense for users and core to our mission. Um, tax is an output, not an input. Uh, we would like to see comprehensive tax reform. That that's something that we've been advocating for quite some time. You know, we've said we'd, we'd like to pay more tax. There's, we get criticism for taxes, but we're following all of the rules as they are, and you just can't send in a check. And so reputationally, the question is, why don't you do more? Well, our answer and the answer of you know, many people who have been thinking about this is we need comprehensive tax reform. That being said, that 15% rate that he threw out is a lot lower than what any de Democrats or Republicans have previously proposed. And I frankly think it's too low because we need revenue so we can invest in this country and do things like infrastructure spend and education and healthcare and the list goes on. So I'd say comprehensive tax reform is good. It would be nice if it got to be a sensible level so we can do things for the people who actually need us to invest in them. But it doesn't change strategy. And audience question, yes. Uh, so there's a lot I love about this company, the values, the people, um, what we stand for. But one of the other amazing things about Google is its reach. You know, the products we make can overnight sometimes touch millions, billions of lives. But if you look, America's vast. I mean, it's 44 hours from Boston to San Diego by car, according to Google Maps. And <laughs> the world's a lot bigger than that. And um, people feel left out of, I think, the tech wave as much as they do about the policies of uh, the last administration, and I think that's what's led to a lot of the decisions you've seen. 
Google can, has so much they can do to educate and empower to help people access information and tools to make them more informed citizens and more successful. Um, and as Kent said, all politics is local, so sometimes the, the answer is to really get boots on the ground. But when I think about what Google does best often, it's the high scale, low touch efforts. Um, and seeing how this election worked, it makes me think maybe the opposite is, is needed too, that high touch, low scale. So my question to you, my charge is, is Google willing to really invest in, in grassroots, super hyper local efforts to bring tools and services and understanding of Google products and knowledge to all these communities far flung around the US and the world so people can really be informed citizens and make the decisions that are really best for themselves and their countrymen. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe Scott and people can add. Uh, so there's a lot of conversations underway uh, you know, uh, in, in the whole category of economic opportunity. We do this many, many places. So for example, today we sign up to commitments on digital skills training in many, many places around the world. And one of the things we could do better is within the U.S., focus on, uh, on parts of the U.S. where it is equally important. Today, don't, uh, we give Google Apps for free. If you look at the education sector, and there are roughly, according to our estimates, about 50 to 60 million people globally who use Google Apps and for free, and you know, we work hard to provide uh, you know, cheaper Chromebooks, and we are investing more. But even in that, we are going to take a look to make sure our educational programs, which we do, are also reaching uh, you know, geographical places, segments of the population where it's probably not fully reaching. So those are all things we are going to look at, and you know, I'm absolutely confident we can do more as we go into 2017. Thank you. Say too, I'm an alpha about wide. I've been working on fiber a bit, and we definitely have fiber builds going on in a wide variety of places, and those are definitely intensive things. So that's one way we're engaging, I guess. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I think we talked about this extensively, but uh, maybe we could talk a little bit more about H-1Bs. Well, the immigration stance. I think in some of uh, Mr. Trump's rhetoric, uh, it was symbolic language used to galvanize a base. He's a businessman, purportedly, and has employed... <laughs> He's employed um, uh, workers with visas. He's employed undocumented uh, uh, workers. So I, I actually don't see an immediate issue that's flaring. I, I would believe being pro-business as a Republican, he would uh, understand the needs of certain sectors to have uh, HB1B visas, et cetera. So let's see how this plays out. Um, I think it's too soon to panic. And, and the other thing to add to that is for Ever since we've been debating immigration reform, there's been strong bipartisan consensus in both houses of Congress that H-1B visas are a great thing for the United States as well as for the people who use them. So I don't see those majorities in, changing, in Congress changing. Um, okay, are we amplifying people's existing beliefs through our personalization algorithms? You know, there is a lot of uh, you know, talk underway, and you know, it's, it's a particular question being asked outside of social media as well, and so obviously YouTube is a big part of it. Um, I think I would like to see a bit more you know, scientific and data-based and uh, empirical work around this to to understand what's happening, uh, you know, and uh, you know, and I, so I, I, I'm not fully sure I fully understand uh, what's happening there at a deeper level, but I think it's something we should think a lot about our products. As I said, you know, we, we core to our goal is, uh, you know, getting information. A bigger question I'm also worried is, I think we think we are getting information and improving knowledge, but I don't think it's reaching certain people at all. So there seems to be a selection bias. People who are able to acquire the knowledge. I think they, get, they have more and more better tools and better ways to do it. But I think there are people who are completely being left out too. So these are all good questions to ask and work through as we head into next year. Um, audience question, yes. So Google's mission is to organize the world's information and make it useful. But during this election cycle, we've seen a lot 
of uh, misinformation, disinformation. We've seen a lot of fake news coming from fake news websites being shared by millions of low information voters on social media. And ultimately, there's been many, many people who've been voting, who've been acting based on completely made up uh, information. So can Google do anything to try to filter this out, to tr try to do something against uh, very organized, very intense uh, campaigns of disinformation targeted at, at low information people? Look, I, I think our investments in machine learning and AI is a big opportunity here. Uh, you know, there, there are work we have done. Uh, the Jigsaw team did around what they call conversation AI around, you know, to, to look at bullying and, you know, commenting. And so a lot of this is a problem of scale and not being able to keep up. So like human systems fail in many of these things. So I think, but, you know, investing more in machine learning and AI could be one way we actually make progress on some of this, uh, the, uh, some of this stuff. Uh, but I think we should do more. And, and probably worth noting, this also ties into cybersecurity because we saw a lot of cyber trolling, you know, by like nation states cyber trolling, uh, and basically Russia. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, we've seen it over time. I guess I don't know. It was never really taken all that seriously. But you know, all the comment boards, and everything, um, by these like faux trolls. So that, that's something else I. I think we ought to really focus on. Uh, audience question, yes. Uh, one of the main messages I've gotten from all of you today is that this election and others like it around the world are a hiccup in history's arc towards progress. But uh, what makes you so sure about that? I mean, is this a relatively new arc or is this the same arc that has included two world wars? Mm. Since it's my metaphor, I'll take it up. Um, <laughs> the, the, there are no guarantees, right? And there are, hiccup is a kind word. There, history is not a linear pattern. We do everything we can to keep it moving in a good direction. Uh, if you look over the broad reach of any 20, 50, 100 year period, there's less death, life, in, life expectancy goes up. People are doing better, more prosperous. The arc does go like this exponentially in terms of standards of living around the world. Yes, it's not completely smooth. It goes up and down. And I think history teaches us that there are periods of populism, of, of nationalism that rise up. And we, that's all the reason we need to be in the arena. That's why we have to work so hard to make sure it doesn't turn into a world war or something catastrophic, but instead is a blip, is a hiccup. But I, I would say echo um, Kent's last sentence because the reason I, I commented on Hillary's statement that we have to continue to believe that we, sh we can fight for that which we value and it's all of our obligation. We can't give up. We can't be complacent. We have to know what our values are and we have to fight for them and protect them and that's what we're committed to doing. Because I think if you just let arcs drift, who the hell knows which way they drift, excuse my language, but um, Whatever. Um, so, <laughs> so I think you, it is. It's incumbent on all of us, people who don't stand up and fight for those that Sundar said so beautifully in his opening comments, that bad stuff happens. So we have to fight for it, or it can end up going the wrong direction. That's what we're going to do. Thank you. Yeah, and I further, I think it's worth really worrying about. I think you know, and there's. You know, data suggests that boredom led to the rise of fascism and also to the communist revolution. I mean, there were many other factors too. Um, but, uh, you know, it sort of sneaks up uh, sometimes, you know, really bad things. So I think it's, it's worth being very vigilant and thinking about all these issues. What can we do to lead to maybe a better quality of governance, decision making, and so forth? Yeah, I was just going to say, I've been looking at governance in general. So, you know, as the election, you know, results came out, people were like, oh, you know, 50% of people were unhappy. Well, I mean, a third of people were deeply angry at their national governments. And I forget, another 20-ish percent are pretty darned angry. Um, and that's actually been true for a long time. And it's been trending down. So I think, you know, you think... Wait, you mean more angry or less angry? More angry. More angry, okay. Yeah. Down as in more angry. Yeah, it's been getting worse, and I think... So I think, um, anyway, that's been something I've been very concerned about for a while. So I think you can also look at the election in context to that. It was reported that, like, that was news. But if you ask people that, like, you know, a year ago, you get the same answer. Um, 
So I do think we have a lot of structural problems in our democracies, and which I think is really, if you're worried about you know, the World War III kind of cases, you know, I think a lot of that will be driven by this deep dissatisfaction um, that people have, which I think some of which is really warranted. Um, so I guess I've been looking at a lot of the structural issues that are causing that. You know, I do think there's a lot of increasing complexity in our governance, which isn't really causing better outcomes for people. I think people feel that kind of intuitively. And we don't have an answer to that. Like, people aren't even talking about that. So um, I'd also encourage people to kind of maybe try to look past the election itself and also think about what's been happening for the last 10 years, last 20 years, look at those trends, and look at the election in the context of that. I mean, how we solve those problems and make things better. And, and maybe worth noting, I mean, that's a broad issue. I mean, beyond uh, beyond Trump specifically, who I know many of us find very offensive. Uh, but you know, in as much, and I know there are a number of Hillary supporters here. I mean, a lot of people might you know view her and more broadly the Democratic Party being also very you know polarized and uh, having its own set of issues. So. Um, I think higher quality governance, you know, would benefit uh, everyone. Um, okay, we have two more questions. I guess. Okay, be super fast. Yes. Or sorry, I'll take one at each mic. Sorry, sir. Maybe. Uh, speaking yeah. to white men, there is an opportunity for you right now to understand your privilege in the society. Take the opportunity to go through the bias busting training. Read about privilege. Read about the real history of oppression in our country. And tomorrow night, watch Thirteenth, the movie that is here. If you can't watch it here, watch it on Netflix. Discuss the issues you are passionate about during Thanksgiving dinner, and don't back down and laugh it off when you hear the voice of oppression speak through metaphors, and I promise to do this. And last question, yes? Is there anything positive you see from this election result? Oof. Uh, boy, that's that's a really <laughs> tough one right now. No, um, I, I, I can I, tell I one. Uh, you oh, know, okay. in, uh, children. Like oh. uh, to be very clear, uh, you know, in his acceptance speech, he said, "U.S. should spend more and improve its infrastructure." And I think a lot of us who have felt that for a while. I think there's a lot more to be done to improve the infrastructure of U.S. So there is a positive thing. That's, I'd also say, um, I mean, I do think like you know, national government's been very gridlocked. Yeah. You know, we do have a situation here where obviously Republicans have a lot of control over what happens and responsibility for that. Um, so hopefully something good will come out of that. Yeah. I mean, I think it's also worth saying, I mean, I find a lot of so many things that Trump has said very offensive, and I don't have very high hopes, but he could do anything. I mean, you have no idea. <laughs> it's just, you really don't know. Um, so I don't know. Maybe he'll do something great. Who knows? Um, <laughs> It'll take a little bit of uh, wishful thinking, but, um, <laughs> but uh, which uh, I will note, if you have wishful thinking, there is food and drink on the patio and be careful of the cookies. 